Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. The Killer Women Vodcast is pleased to be a part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. To learn more about Danielle and her books, visit her at www.daniellegerard.com and to access all of our vodcasts, go to youtube.com forward slash authors on the air. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with 4 million listeners. I'm your host, suspense author Danielle Gerard, and my guest today is Karen Slaughter. Karen is the author of more than 20 instant New York Times bestselling novels, including the Edgar-nominated Cop Town and standalone novels Pretty Girls, The Good Daughter, and Pieces of Her. She has published in 120 countries with more than 40 million copies sold across the globe. Pieces of Her is a Netflix original series starring Toni Collette, and False Witness, the Grant County and Will Trent series are in development for television. Slaughter is the founder of the Save the Libraries Project, a nonprofit organization established to support libraries and library program. A native of Georgia, Karen lives in Atlanta. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so fun. So I, uh, I have my, I, I'm so many wonderful lines in here, Karen, that I literally like tagged all my favorites. You make me laugh out loud at the same time that I'm, you know, we're cringing from. Um, some of your, you know, fabulously very descriptive violent scenes. So I also have my book of the month club version. Congratulations. Tell our listeners and watchers a little bit about Girl Forgotten. So, I, I mean, it's being called a sequel to Pieces of Her, but it's it really stands alone also. Uh, at the core of the story, I guess, is women um, making choices for themselves, right? That kind of question really propels the book. So you have Andrea Oliver, who has um, been in pieces of her, uh, pushed by her mother to make uh, that leap into adulthood. And then uh, she makes the leap and her mother says, no, not like that, <laughs> uh, which is a typical mother thing to do. Totally. I want you to grow up, but I don't want you to grow up that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and Andrea has become a U.S. Marshal. And Laura is a criminal, so she's very against that. But there's also a story that takes place in the 1980s, and that's about Emily Vaughn, who is a teenage girl who's very much part of a clique in high school. And unfortunately, she's in the first chapter of a Karen Slaughter novel, so you know things don't turn out well for her. Um, but it was a really interesting uh, detour into the past. And, you know, we talk about people getting canceled all the time and we kind of forget that happened before the internet, uh, especially in high school. So Emily yeah. is a girl who got canceled through no fault of her own uh, and suffering the consequences. And, you know, every book I think starts with a question that you have to answer by the end. And, you know, for me, the question is these two women kind of figuring out the kind of adult they want to be. And, you know, unfortunately, Emily's choice is a cut a little bit, but Andrea gets to decide who she wants to be. Well, and I'm, you know, I, obviously the Tony Collette, um, the pieces of her, that what a fun series that is. And if anybody has not already binge watched that, it's so binge worthy. And the way that they did your first scene um, in the diner, I mean, it's really, really well done. So that was super fun. But before we talk about the movie business, which of course I'm sure everybody wants to hear about, I want to hear about what you just talked about, which is, you know, it, these are two uh, connected novels, but very different. And this is, I think the first time you've done this, sort of a spinoff. Uh, you have your Will Trent series, of course, but is this the first time you sort of taken a book and then spun another book from those characters other than the series? It is. And, you know, it was kind of fun. So these are also the first books that I've written that take place predominantly outside of Georgia. So that was a really fun thing for me to do. And I got to write about a part of the country that I really love, which is Maryland, particularly uh, in the coastal areas. So that was really interesting. But there's a line in it that I think carries through the book. And it's something Laura says to Andrea, which is wherever you go, there you are. Right. Um, which is, you know, everybody figures that out eventually. Um, most of us do it in college. I remember a friend of mine saying, 
why do I keep, you know, every guy I date's an asshole? And it's like, well, maybe it's you and your choices and not the assholes. Right. <laughs> uh, we all have that moment where we wake up and think, oh, maybe I'm the problem. Right. And Andrea is in the process of doing that. And, you know, she ends up in this beachside town, which is very similar to the beachside town she grew up in. Um, but she's finally taking control of her life, which is what I like. You know, it, yeah. she was a bit spinning around in pieces of her and trying to find out who she was. And I think she pretty solidly knows by the end of this book who she wants to be. Absolutely. And she's got some good, I love the, you know, Leonard Bible in particular, like what a great name, who is her partner, her, her U.S. Marshal partner is, is wonderful. And of course, Mike shows up um, and we we get to see him again. But so were you right? It was, did this book sort of was the, the seed for this book, did it happen during writing the other book? Or did you sort of feel like, listen, because Andrea, like you said, you in the last book, she was a spinning. I mean, she was trying to figure out, she was she had no idea what her own past was until sort of the, the launch of that book. So what how, how did this develop? Like how did the seed for, I'm gonna do this other book, you know, with this character. Well, it really, when I finished writing pieces of her, I thought it would be a standalone, but then I started to read the scripts um, for the series and it made me wonder, you know, pieces of her is Andrew saying, who is my mother, right? Who is this person I've known all my life? And this book, Andrew is saying, who is my father who I've really never known or met? What kind of guy is he? And also, you know, there's, there's, a, it's no coincidence that she's joined the good guys, as it were, because her parents are both bad guys. And she's wondering, do I have that in me? And, you know, I think Leonard Bible, his name's Catfish, but I think yeah. he's a really good sort of wind in her sails that directs her in the right direction. And we all need that. I know when I was in ninth grade, my ninth grade teacher was that for me. Um, she really made me understand who I could be as a person. And that that was invaluable, you know, it, to understand, well, you can choose to be a nice person. You can choose to do the right thing. You're not really a victim of everything that came before, um, you know, and fortunately, I was able to make that transition. I know a lot of people aren't, you know, who have suffered really bad things in their childhood. Fortunately, I was spared that. But for Andrea, she does come to that realization, wait, I can stop this horrible pattern and maybe have a better life than my mother did. Right. Right. So she was, I mean, so that's an interesting thing too, is you're, you're so lauded um, for your characters. And so I wonder, you know, is, do both, most of your books sort of start with like an, a question about a, a person, like something that has happened to a person and how do they react? Is that sort of, or are you sort of like this, a scenario, you know, when the idea starts to germinate? It's a little of both, you know, with a, something like Pieces of Her that really opens with a bang. Right. You know, it started with that scene, but then I had to justify it because it is a very shocking, violent opening. And I never want to be one of the, those writers who writes just to shock people. I want to put it in context. Yeah. I will say that had I written that opening uh, maybe 15 years ago, it, the entire story would have been about that. But unfortunately, we've become so anesthetized to these mm -hmm. mass shooting events. I mean, it, it might not have even made it in the news now. Um, right. because the body count was so low uh, or there would have been another one that overshadowed it. So, you know, in many ways, as a crime writer, you know this, you have to pay attention to what the public's level of credulity is and you have a for me as a writer there's a slower build into that kind of action it feels more quiet right and, and to me that's that's one of the more horrible ways uh that violence happens is where you think everything's normal and you're not really prepared for anything bad and then it happens and it changes your your entire world all in a like heartbeat, exactly. Well, and what a, and another thing about this book that felt so timely, right? Is you know here, and you can't have known this when you when you started this book unless you wrote it like in a month. Um, is the whole you know women's choice and Roe v. Wade, and here mm -hmm. we are like with a woman, and you know you 
we look back, I mean, I'm a child of the 80s. I, you know, I think in 1981, I was 10, which I think is probably about the same age you were. And it was like, we always look back on the 80s as this incredibly romantic time, right? We forget about like misogyny was as bad or worse, you know, um, you know, everything that was homophobic. I mean, it's all this is sort of like, we move somewhat in, in forward and then yet, all of a sudden, like Emily's choice, what Emily went through would very much happen to tons of women today in all sorts of states for different reasons. So, you know, have people commented on that yet that you, it feels like such a poignant, timely story in that way as well? You know, as you know, books are written well ahead of time of publication. <laughs> so you're exactly right. I mean, I was seeing some things and hearing some things and we all we've all, I think, lived in fear of Roe being overturned for quite a long time. And of course, we were called hyperbolic, and that'll never happen. And, uh, you know, you just need to vote for the person who's going to put money in your pocket. But, you know, are, are people saying women are more interested in the economy and crime? Well, an unplanned pregnancy, there goes your economy. Yeah. Crime, rape is a crime that can end in an unwanted pregnancy, right? So they're all really interlinked in a way. And when I was writing this, I was mindful of that, the choice being taken away for Emily. And, and she does have her choice taken away. No one consults her, you know, and her parents, her parents absolutely would have sent her to California to spend time with her aunt, right? right? If they could have, but unfortunately it got out that she was pregnant. And so they were, they were, you know, in this position where they had to figure out what to do next. And you know this, when we were in high school, girls who got pregnant disappeared and no mm -hmm. one ever talked about them again. <laughs> exactly. it, it was like they went into this Victorian confinement. Right. Um, and But when I was in high school, we did have a girl who came back and she had her baby and she was the least popular girl in school. I mean, it is hilarious because we were all doing what she got caught doing, right? Right, right. But, but I, I think in a lot of ways, women are the worst policers of other women because she was so ostracized. And, you know, I was kind of an outsider, so she was still my friend. Um, but it, it really was a kind of a crash course in how we separate bad girls from good girls. And, you know, the tragic thing was she was really smart. Right. very, very smart, like Emily, and, you know, would have easily gone to college and done something, if not for the fact that this school, this town, her parents, her church decided that she was a bad person and didn't deserve to have a good person's life. Right. And nobody asked that question of who the father, the father, right? The father is 100% off the hook, right? Because yeah. he's just doing what boys do. Yeah, you that, don't want to um, ruin his life. That is the irony of that, I know. And actually, that was another thing I love I love about the story. And all and all of your books really do explore these questions about, you know, women and sort of what it and of course this is killer women. So I love to sort of delve into the the part of it is that the, in, in this book, almost every woman is under the thumb of a man at some point, right? I mean, that's yeah. Andrea's journey is to get out from under that thumb. And and you know, we watch her do that. But mm -hmm. but you know, Emily and the judge. Um, and I mean, everybody, right? All, you know, Ricky, Emily, all these, um, everybody. I mean, it's really, and it's, it hasn't changed that much between, you know, when Emily got pregnant in the eighties and what's going on in the, in the town today. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It kind of goes back to what I was saying about my friend in college, because I think what Andrea is learning is she's got to find the good men, right? Yeah. And that, that's hard, you know, it's sort of like the old saying, um, you know, here's a bowl of M&Ms with a, a thousand M&Ms, but two of them are poison. So, you know, there are some women who will always get that poison M&M. Yeah. You just got to look for the right one and, you know, don't compromise your standards. Uh, and that's what Andrea's learning. Because, you know, at first with Mike, she's pushing him away, pushing him away, pushing mm -hmm. him away. And it's yeah. like, he finally realizes, wait a minute, I don't have to push away the good people in my life. Right. And that, that again is an important lesson. And also, you know, standing up to her mother uh, and realizing, okay, I can disappoint my mother and it's not the end of the world. And maybe that disappointment says more about her than it does about me. So right. it really 
you know, any woman who's gone through that process uh, totally understands what that's like to kind of pull away from your parents and stand up for being your own person. And actually, I love that Catfish uh, and his marriage is sort of one of the few in the book that we were like, well, that's the kind of marriage we would want. And that's a lovely because it's it's a very minor part of the story, but you you weave it in to remind us that, yeah, this is what a, a healthy, good partnership um, looks like. And it's a good role model for, you know, for Andrea and, and her story in her story. So, um, so, OK, so talk to us about sort of your you're obviously you're writing a book a year, you know, on the treadmill. It, um, and so now you've prob you probably already written, we'll talk a little bit about what's coming next for you. But um, when you're in that year time, how much of your time is sort of spent like, you know, thinking about, are you somebody who really plans out, figures out the character, all the, all their, uh, you know, psychology and the story before you start writing? Are you a, you know, a plotter or a pantser is what, you know, if they call them that, how does it work for you? You know, it's, again, it's a little of both. Um, and it depends on what my year looks like. Uh, obviously because of COVID, I'm not traveling as much. Right. I don't know about you, but I found it harder to write, you know, right. I mean, and not just like, oh my God, a million people have died. Right. right. But so just the uncertainty and the stress of that. And he, I thought, boy, it should be much easier to write. Cause I've suddenly got all this free time. Cause I'm, I'm like you, I'm lucky enough to be a writer and have right. that, you know, and so it just was really difficult in a way. And I, I found myself having to plot more uh, than I normally do, just so that I'm thinking ahead. I didn't realize a lot of my plotting comes when I'm traveling or when I'm on an, oh. at an airport or in a car, or, you know, that kind of stuff. Where, right, interesting. It, where I'm totally removed from my regular life, you know, because at home, I'm sure you kind of do this sometimes. You're like, what time's the mail here? Maybe I should go to the box <laughs> You're, oh, it's the UPS guy. I wonder how his kids are doing, you know? Right. So there's always this distraction. Mm -hmm. um, and those quiet times at an airport were really processing times for me. And so I had to find different ways to do that. And, you know, as far as, you know, a, a standalone versus a, a series book, it's much easier to jump in character-wise to a series book, particularly Will and Sarah, because I write procedurals, right? Yes. So there's a procedure to it, you know, an investigation. Uh, with Andrea, there's a procedure to an investigation. Right. Uh, but if it's a real standalone, like something like False Witness, I've got to do that, all that world building and figure out, okay, I've got two people who aren't police officers who kind of want to investigate a crime. So how do I make it believable that they are, you know, investigating this and trying to figure out who the bad person is without it being one of those two feisty gals you know, <laughs> right. and, right. and, and solve crimes at night sort of thing, which those books are great, but they're not what I write, you know, no. it's, it's right. a lot of finding the credibility in it because you know your readers are so savvy about crime now. I mean, between <laughs> podcasts and Dateline and 48 Hours and all that. They, they know shit, bullshit when they see it, right? Yes, they do, right. They have to really work to make sure they're not taken out of the story. So that that is a lot of the plot part for me is, okay, I think this is how a cop would do it. I think this is how technology works, but I need to be 100% certain because someone in Boise is going to write me a letter. You know, imagine my horror that you, <laughs> you know, didn't know the sequencing on this DNA. Uh, so I, I try to make sure I get all that right. Right. You got to be careful. Well, and it, for you, it's also, I'm, I'm curious about this because do you know sort of, I mean, like for instance, obviously built into every novel, there are some twists that we don't expect, right? The plot's going along one direction and then all of a sudden we're going in the other direction. When you're, you know, when you start a book, do you have any of that in mind? Do you sort of know who's the guilty party? Um, and then you're just sort of plotting the, or is it really like, here are my characters, let's put them together and see what happens. I always know who the bad guy is or a bad woman. Sometimes I have bad women. Absolutely. Um, I, no, no one ever gives me credit for killing men or making women bad, you know, but it's, I really try to balance it. But it, to me, it's really important to know who the bad person is. Sometimes I'll throw in a conspirator along the way, mm -hmm. um, but I want to write in a way that's fair to my readers. So I don't want me to be surprised when the reveal happens because they might not find it believable. You know, it, I'm not one of these, if, 
400 pages in, there's a butler so that he can do that <laughs> person. Um, the butler did it, right. That's right. Yeah. So I, I'm really careful about hiding these things in plain sight and making sure that they logically make sense. So you get at the end and you're like, oh, I can't believe I missed that instead of mm. what the hell just happened. And also, I think that one of the things, again, that sort of goes back to your your skill with characterization is that your bad guys are... Nobody, I mean, in your world, which I love, and I think it's true in the real world, nobody is all black or all white. So right. the, the, your bad guys also have good moments, right? They're human and they make mistakes. So when you, and some, of, some people are certainly more evil than others, right? And that goes back to sort of what we talked about at the beginning of this conversation that, some, that you know, Andrea was wondering if she's, you know, am I born evil because my parents are evil, or, you know, evil, but crime, criminals. And I think you do a really nice job of, we almost feel some compassion for some of the bad guys, right? Particularly, I think, yeah. in this story. Well, I think I, I always have an explanation. You know, it, it's never, they did a bad thing because they're bad. Right. Um, because people become criminals and, and bad people for a reason. Um, and even if it's like some sort of mental illness or, I mean, not to say that a mental illness means you're going to be a bad person, right? right. I mean, there's right. the mental illness and then there's the personality. Right. Um, and if you are inclined to be a terrible person, then certain things can amplify that um, or brain damage or, you know, whatever happens to people along the way. Right. Um, so I want to, I want to, again, just ground that in reality and say, this is why this person did this thing. And, you know, you're right. No one thinks they're not the hero of their own story. You right. know, even if they have, know that they have done really terrible things, they kind of convince themselves, oh, it wasn't that terrible or they deserved it or, you know, this, they made me do it. You know, there's right. always some sort of structure to hold up their lie. And that's really interesting to me because I, I, I started writing crime novels because I want to know why people do bad things. And yeah. most of the time it's because they don't think they're bad people. Right. Isn't that crazy? Well, and the, a lot, these last few books you've, um, speaking of sort of bad people and in bad situations, cults have, have featured kind of, just, you know, yeah. in some of your more recent books, which is such a fascinating, uh, I mean, it's such a fascinating scenario and, and, and who gets drawn in and all this stuff. So, um, so tell, I mean, obviously there's so many things that are, that are interesting and, and um, things to explore, but what do, you, what do you think triggered your interest in sort of cults? You know, I want to know if it's a Gen X thing. Like, was there a movie of the week about cults that a lot of us saw? Because <laughs> I, I know mean, like cults are incest, right? I'm totally right. down with those. And I know incest is because V.C. Andrews. Totally V.C. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Attic, yeah. Ours in the attic, 100%. Yeah, she got us. She totally got she us. Totally did. But, you know, maybe it was like a hangover from Jonestown because that was so I was so wondering hard. if it was, yeah, I was wondering if it yeah. was, because that seems about the right time for us, right? When we yeah, were yeah it, we came along a little later. But, yeah, I have no idea why I'm so fascinated. Groupthink really, I think, is terrifying right mm -hmm. but the the wonderful thing and wonderful meaning from a writer standpoint not from being in it standpoint <laughs> right. about cults well, the two things always fascinate me you know women don't start cults to have sex with everybody right like women who run cults there's generally a lot of cleaning involved and like clothes washing and <laughs> that sort of thing men who start cults is like sex you know right. Um, and the other thing I find interesting is the arrogance of it, because what, what cults do is you're right and everybody else is wrong. I mean, we see this with QAnon with a lot of people who have fallen, unfortunately, victim to this is that they're right about it and being right kind of makes you a special person. And so I always think, well, what, what in their lives makes them not feel special that they would cling to this identity that it would be so important to them um uh, and that is where i mean a lot of crime stories come from right is people right. thinking they're above the law or they can justify themselves out of something or you know so that kind of just really i think is fascinating to me and also i'm always fascinated by people who say i would never join a cult 
but it's like, dude, you cannot stop watching the Kardashians, right? Exactly. You know? So there's exactly. a little bit of that in all of us or, you know, the, with reality shows or right. so you think you can dance or, you know, there's just this, this part of us that wants to belong to something. And some of times it's in, innocuous, like right. Big Brother. And sometimes it's QAnon and, you know, I mean, it's, it's your church, it's your gym, it's your, you know, it's everywhere it is. And exactly. the, the, the care, you know, it's the charismatic leader, which I think is also really interesting. And, you know, it, as you said, like for men, it's um, the ability to sort of say, I am, I know, ex I know exactly what everybody here should be doing. And I'm going to tell you, right? right. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. Right the power, the power. I mean, that is, and I think we see that. I mean, I think we've seen that in politics, right? All these leaders who yeah. have um, inspired, you know, people to, I know, to it's do crazy. Cause they're, and then people are so disappointed when they're politicians. Yeah. I know. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. What is, you don't what have to go to dinner with them. Just let them run the government. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. That would be better if we didn't like them and they just did a really good job running the government. Think about right. how that would change like the, the world. The person you hated most in high school who was straight A, never did anything. That's who you want running things. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Not the jock yeah. who got arrested four times. Right. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. Or the guy yeah. who could talk his way out of anything. Because that's who right. we end up with politicians, right? They get pulled yeah. over and they're like, no, listen, buddy. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, Karen, the other thing you do, so, and I actually went back in my book to try to find it. There's all these fabulous lines. So you're actually incredibly funny. I mean, you, there was one line in the beginning about it. It, it feels like it was a unicorn shooting rainbows or something. At any rate, I, I couldn't locate that one line. But there were all these fabulous lines. Um, like one you say, um, it was akin to playing Where's Waldo inside Dante's first circle of hell, which I just loved. And then this one, which hit so close to home. She didn't know of any woman on the internet who hadn't been subjected to at least one violent rape threat for simply expressing her opinion. So, um, and then I, I wanted to, along the lines of things I thought were so fabulous, there's the scene, uh, Andrea is an artist, if, if people didn't, um, read pieces of her, they, they maybe not know that. And she runs into an, another woman who's um, in the book is also an artist, right? And um, did you do some, you know, research on this? Cause I felt like your, your art talk felt, I mean, I'm not an artist or an art talker, but it felt very genuine to me. Well, I mean, you know this from your own writing, I'm sure that the best thing you can do when you write fields you're not really immersed in is to be a good mimic. And so with Andrea in particular, all of her metaphors, all everything has to do with color, with texture, with, and that is not native to me. I mean, a lot of my art would have like a, a bunny in it or a cat, you know, and that's why yeah. I like it. And, you know, especially like dealing, I've got, I've actually, I've got the book right here, like uh, do, doing with collage, right? Oh, 60 right. For this thing, 60 bucks. But we should know, be writing those books. Right. So, <laughs> so it's like, how do you even talk about art? How do right. artists approach art? And so I talked to several artists in Atlanta. We've had a lot of really good ones and just kind of listen to what they use as far as their language to describe art and how they feel about it and that sort of thing. And I, that, that's how I did my research for Andrea is just getting kind of immersed in that and picking up on their language and making sure you know, everything she talks about, she talks about color, she talks about style, you know, that sort of thing. Those are her references. And I kind of love that about her character because it, it gives her like a different, um, and, you know, I, I'm sure most people don't even notice that that's what's going on, but it gives her a sense of authenticity in that world. It's true. And you do it flawlessly. And actually it makes her investigative you know, she picks up on some things in the investigation because of the way she looks at the world, which I thought um, was really, you know, so that's a, because it's exactly what somebody who really came from the art world would do. They would mm -hmm. see something, you know, in a certain, in, in that way. Anyway, that was, um, that was so fun. Um, so I have a question for you now, when, you, you know, when you're working through your process, you write do you share your work along the way? Do you work with your editor along the way? Do you turn in the whole book? Do you share it with your partner? What what happens during the course of a of a Karen Slaughter book? Well, no one sees it but my editor until it's ready. 
Um, I'm very careful about that. I don't, I'm, I guess I'm kind of arrogant. I don't want anybody's opinion. Um, <laughs> I, write the, I write the books for myself, honestly, and to please my editor. I've known her uh, my entire professional career. And wow. she's been my same editor. We've kind of grown it. We're about the same age. We grew up in the business um, and she's wonderful. I call her my brain's best friend. And usually we meet um, at, at some point and we just kind of spend a couple of days and talk about what I want to do and what I'm thinking about. And she'll do the important things like, okay, well, how many days does this take place? Because I'd have everything happen in the same day. Or <laughs> right. how old was she when this happened? So, you know, because I'm, I'm really bad with time. That's right. why my first books were like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So, right. you know, just not uh, be all crammed together. Um, and then I, I start writing it and I'll give it to her and we call them chunks. I'll say the next chunk is ready. Um, maybe, you know, a hundred pages at a time. And she'll say, okay, I love it or, or what, you know what these are the the pitfalls that might you might see I mean I've done it so often that I can kind of anticipate what the the pitfalls are mm -hmm. um, so it's just more like that and then once we get it ready uh, my U.S. editor reads it and because my my primary editor is my UK editor oh she is okay that's yeah, fabulous yeah. So then my U.S. editor reads it and she'll, you know, she's got a fresh read on it, which is great. And, right. you know, she'll have some suggestions and then that's pretty much it. So you, yeah, so you did the whole thing. So this is another thing I thought, I saw this um, picture of you, right? This is the, this is your headshot for um, Cop Town, right? For your first book. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and you look, I mean, we were, right? You were, this is what, 2001, this came out? Oh, Cop Town? No, no, no. Um, it was 2001 when my first book came out. I don't, I don't know what that, that could be the first one. Yeah. It, you look so, well, so this is, I would thought this was funny. So this is my first headshot, <laughs> Karen. <laughs> so I was thinking about you because I felt like you look so right. We look so young and I don't know about you, but in the beginning, did people look at you and say, gosh, how can somebody so sweet yes. looking? Right? They still say that. I don't look sweet anymore. But they do. Anyway. They'll say, I thought you'd be taller, which is like a really weird thing to say. Um, but or bigger, you know, like I should be some kind of macho. I don't know. Um, but it is strange because very early in my career, I kind of looked 12. And they people, if, if I said I was a, a writer, oh, are you published? Yes. Who's your publisher? Harper Collins. Oh, that's a real publisher, right? I mean, it's just this sort of, and then they assume I write children's books or right. cozies. And I mean, it's just crazy. I don't think that happens as much to women anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think people ask Gillian Flynn, like, do you write children's books? Um, but very, very early on, that was the, the those were the questions. Um, right. And most of, I don't know if you got this, but they would say she writes like a man. Right? Cause they're like, how do I compliment this woman? Uh, oh, she, I'll compare her to a man. That's, That's the, the, you know, right. or, or muscular. And, you know, I caught a lot of shit for writing so unflinchingly about violence as if right. women shouldn't be interested in the crimes that happen to women. Um, That's the part that really changed. got me. Yeah, that's, that's changed. You know, one thing that has not changed if I say, it, like, I have a woman saying the F word a lot, or if I have one goddamn, then I'm going to get 80 letters from Texas. They're okay yeah. with the rape and the murder and the pedophilia. And it's like this one word. They're like, you should not do that. <laughs> do not you take the Lord's name in vain. And yes. it's the, I mean, it's like, can you imagine being a an actual police officer dealing with the kind of crimes that they deal with, but being like, ah, darn. Like it God. just isn't, it's just, God, talk that's about, a bad one. yeah, talk about believability. Yeah. They swear like, you know, they, I mean, I would swear like a, I swear like a sailor anyway. And if for sure, yeah. if that was my life. Hell, I know, but one is, thing about the January 6th hearings that really annoys me is they are all saying fuck constantly and I'm getting police for it. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. I know. Come on. And it's true. I, I have, I found like now Sometimes it's like, you got to be careful, like how soon into the book you use the F word, uh, you know, and who uses it. The women are supposed to be, 
we're still supposed to be more proper. That is just such bullshit, right? God, yeah, I hate that about yeah. it. Yeah, so, I don't, you know, I got letters after my uh, second or third book. And after that, you might as well call it like death fuck, because I'm going to just use it as often as I can. Right. Good for you. Yeah, you're like, listen, don't, if you don't like it, you know. Well, I write for adults, them. you know. Yeah. And the kids, I'm sorry, but I got a 22 year old and a 20 year old and they, they cuss as much as anybody else. So yeah. yeah, we're not, this is not for, you know, kindergarten children. And, and exactly. if you're letting your kindergartners listen or read, then that's a, there's bigger issues than the F-bomb. Yes. Yes. So, so I read somewhere that you, um, that when you're sort of on deadline, you go and stay with your dad. Um, oh, not with him. Cause we would kill each other. Oh. But um, I have, I have a cabin in the mountains in North Georgia and he's right down the street from me. So he makes sure that I'm taking care of myself and he'll leave soup on the, the porch for me. So I have something to eat. That is so fun. Now, did you, did you sort of always, I mean, was he surprised that you became a writer? Was he surprised at what you write? Well, yes and no. I mean, I never really talked about wanting to be published because I figured uh, I'd wait till I got published. Georgie, Georgie, Georgie. Hey, come here. Sorry. That's, That's okay. Tiny dog who just saw somebody through the window. Um, you figured um, you'd just wait till you got published before you'd talk yeah, about it. Yeah, because I just, I had this idea in my head that you couldn't call yourself a writer until you were published, um, which is kind of a, it, it, I, I really just put it on myself. Um, and I, it, so I just wanted to make sure I could do it. But, you know, my dad was always supportive of me. And when I graduated high school, he said, you can do anything you want. You just can't live here. And so <laughs> I had to get a job and figure all that out, which was yeah. pretty good, you know. And yeah. by all account, I mean, it's almost impossible for writers to make a living being writers. It just right. doesn't happen. So I'm aware of how lucky I am. And, you know, even on my worst days, I think, you know, I'm doing what I want for a right. living. Not many people can say that. Right. And you know what though, Karen, like this is not, you know, you are not a like slapdash writer. It's very clear from your books that you are in it. You're working really, really hard. And I think, you know, that you've earned it. It wasn't like, oh, she just happened to have this, you know, one brilliant idea. And then, you know, boom, she's, she's 40 million copies of her books are around the world. That is not how that works. So we know that too. And I know you, we have to, you, you're going to leave us pretty soon, but I want, we got to hear about Netflix. We got to hear about yeah. what it was like to sell the book, to, to, to watch it come, um, you know, in creation. Well, I'm a bad example because everything was very good. <laughs> you know, most of the time people are not happy. A friend of mine said it's like going to the dentist and having all your teeth pulled while they put money in your pocket. Uh, but that was not my experience. You know, um, it everybody at Netflix was really great. Uh, the writers, the showrunner, all of the all of them were amazing. Um, and I got to go on set when they filmed in Atlanta. That was pretty cool. Um, I am actually in episode four very, very briefly. Right. Like, blink, you miss me, which I'm totally cool with because I'm, I'm, I'm going into a store as Bella Heathcott, who plays Andrea, is going out. And she's like this extremely tall, thin, beautiful Australian woman. And, <laughs> you know, I feel like a lump beside her. So it's like, don't compare us. Um, it, I mean, it was just fascinating to see how that works because- it's so weird. Everything right. about it is not normal. Um, like even that we were we were supposed to be in a bookstore, but we were actually in an abandoned or vacant storefront in downtown Atlanta. And then when they filmed the interior part of that, they were in a Barnes and Noble 30 miles away. Yeah. So it was just kind of crazy seeing how they put it together. Um, but I loved it. And my my Will Trent series got picked up by ABC and they're going to start filming I, it in Atlanta. So I hope I get to see. The oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you will. You got to put yourself in one of those episodes. That's I saw that this morning. That's really, really exciting. So when they sent you the script, obviously you're not writing it. You weren't involved yeah. in the, but you they sent it to you and, and you get to say sort of, 
I mean, well, I get, you know, I get consultation, which you probably have consultation on your jackets, which means they show it to you. And if you don't like it, they're like, we're sorry, you don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> or their sales well, loves it. <laughs> yeah. Right. We consulted you and therefore our part is done. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they listened to me. They had some really thoughtful questions about motivation. A lot of pieces of her is Andy sitting in a car thinking and you can't really have that on screen. So they had to, you know, take some license, which I agreed with. And I thought it was really neat, What you have to remember, like as a writer, but also as a fan of a certain series is that it's an interpretation. It can't really be an adaptation. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's all about what works visually. Whereas when we write, it's all about what works on the page, you know? Yeah. And so and much of it's internal. Well, you know, and also think about the fact that you're every character in the book when you're writing it, you know? And then you have like Toni Collette, who's got amazing ideas for her character and says, right. let's do more of this. And you've got Bella saying, well, maybe this is what the character does. So there, it's not you anymore. It's, right. it's er all these creative people bringing their creative thoughts and ideas to it. Which, which is so great. It, it's amazing, but as a writer, I would hate that. Right. right. I, want right. I don't want to collaborate. Don't right. collaborate. I want ownership over everything. Yes, yes. Well, I, I'm glad it was so positive. I mean, it shows on the screen. I think a lot of times we see a series and think, I mean, you know, I'm a book lover. I always see the movie and think, oh, you know, it didn't, because of course a movie can't possibly do what a book can do, right? right. Um, so I always have to, you know, I always have to read the book first, but I thought they did, I mean, I think for, you know, for not being able to do the book, right? I mean, no, no book is, it's not possible. They, I thought they did an amazing job. And having Toni Collette, like what a, you know, she's yeah. just, with that knife in her hand, I was like, holy. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that was pretty impressive. Um, okay, so before you leave us, tell us what is next, Karen? What, what's coming up next? Another Will and Sarah. I'm working on it right now. Um, and it's more, it's a little more Sarah focused. Um, so, you know, I go back and forth on who gets to focus. Uh, and I'm real excited about it, but I can't tell you anything about it. <laughs> That's a, you'd have to kill us. Okay, so we'll leave yeah. that. And that's number eight. Is it? Is that number eight? In, in the series? Will Trent series, yeah. In number yeah. eight. That's so exciting. Well, listen, Karen, this was, I mean, I'm sure if everybody hasn't bought it yet, which I'm, I'm sure they have, um, this is a, it's just one of, it's another Karen Slaughter book. That's probably the best. I'm not going to compare you to a man, Karen. You're way, way better. So oh, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us today. And to everybody listening, this is Killer Women, and I'm your host, Danielle Gerard. And today's guest was Karen Slaughter. Join us next time. Bye.